Welcome to Changeable. This is episode number 98, Freedom from Codependency with Del Ade Jones. You're tuned in to Changeable with Dr. Amy Johnson. Changeable podcast is all about breaking habits, ending anxiety, and the ironic way change really works. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey there, welcome back to Changeable. I am so excited for you to hear this conversation with Dell. I um I have known Dell for a while. I've seen so much weight fall off of her, not physical, mental, emotional weight fall away. I've seen her look brighter and open up and just seem so much lighter. And I never knew her story until we sat down and talked about it for this episode. And the thing about stories, you know, I think in our world where we look beyond the content often, stories can kind of get a bad rap, like, oh, that's just your past and it's just your story. But no, (laughs) I don't see it that way at all. I mean, we, it, it makes up our psychology. And our psychology, no matter what we've seen, our psychology plays a gigantic role in our everyday life. It just does. Now, where we look in this understanding is that we don't have to be a victim to our psychology. We don't have to only live within old thought and feeling and memory and issues and all of that kind of, we don't have to live in the past, but that doesn't mean it's it's not worth looking at and talking about at times or that it isn't going to show up in in our everyday life forever, because it is. What's incredible is how, how without the past changing, obviously, how different that can come to be when we see more about who we are and how our experience works. And that's what, that's what this conversation with Dell really highlights. So Dell will talk about her past and, um, and it's, Probably not something, the details of her past, I'm guessing and hoping, are probably not something that you can relate to all that well. I certainly couldn't. But what what is amazing about hearing human beings telling their story is that even when we can't relate to their details and their content at all, we still feel that connection because we're all the same beyond that. And sometimes I think when you hear someone's story and it's so different from your life experiences, you feel even closer with them. Like you connect even more because I think somewhere in our mind, we're like, whoa, none of the surface level junk matches, but why do I still understand this person? (laughs) You know, like why can I still feel what they're talking about? And it's because beyond all that surface level junk, we are all the same. We, We have all felt the same things, even though our paths have looked very, very different. So Dell's story is one of so much hope and so much freedom. And like I told her at the end of the episode, this is such an example of the fact that no matter what happens, it's not, it's not making permanent dings and dents on who we are. If it was, Dell would be completely caught up in codependency and all the other issues she's had from her past, but she's not, she's not at all anymore in a really beautiful way. And um, yeah, so hopeful, such a story of resilience and really fascinating. And you're just going to love her when you hear her talk about uh, what she's been through. So enjoy this conversation with Del. Hi, Del. Thanks so much for being Unchangeable. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for allowing me to come on here and share my story. Yeah, I'm really excited um, to hear about it because I know, you know, I know you're you're writing about it. You've been through a lot. You've uh, just in the short year, two years, I guess, probably that I've known you, you've seen so much, and it seems like a lot has changed. But I've never really known the backstory, um, and I think I think things like this just I don't know for for me. Um, stories are just so interesting. Not even what they show us about change. Like that's kind of obviously what this podcast about, what your show is about, um, you know, how people change and, and what we can see around who we are and how we work. But 
I don't know, more and more lately, I've just been so into just hearing stories. What fictional, nonfiction, doesn't even matter, but like there's just something so juicy in a story. So um, yeah, so I'm really excited to, to hear yours. Oh, that's so sweet. And I, I totally agree. I love people's stories. I just, I think that's how we connect. That's how yeah. we, you know, just, um, it's like, yeah, me too. Oh, really? Oh my God, I'm not alone. Yeah. I think that's so helpful is to know that you're not alone. Yes. And whatever you've experienced is, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, that's the big one for me. So um, to give you a little bit of background, well, before I came across the principles, I had spent close to 30 years in therapy, probably about, about 28 years um, and hundreds of thousands of dollars I calculated the other day. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite shocking. Um, and also just so many workshops and the whole time just on a, a spiritual path as well, um, just trying to fix myself. I felt so defective, so broken and, um, and different to everybody else, which is what's so funny. It's until we start sharing our stories, we realize, you know, we're not alone. Yeah. But I'll just give you a little bit of background on, um, how I grew up and, and why I had such a solid, um, view of myself as so broken and defective. And so it started off, I was born in, in the late 50s in um, Wales, North Wales in the UK. And so it definitely wasn't, um, you know, the 60s and 70s of California. <laughs> it, was, um, it was quite puritanical and um, Methodist and very sort of chapel and Bible, things like that. Um, but my mother was just I don't know, I don't know where she quite came from, but she didn't sort of um, fit into that mold, put it that way. And um, I was born the fifth child. Uh, she had three children by her, her marriage, her first marriage. And then she met um, my father, and I share the same father as my sister that's a year older than me, and my younger brother who's, who was four years younger than me. And he was a married man that had his own family. They lived in the village. We lived in the, in the outskirts of the village in the countryside. And um, so he had a wife and he had children. And my mother was basically his mistress. Um, but in her mind, I think she, she wanted to believe it was much more than that. And especially as it lasted for eight years and she had three children with him, she felt that, um, you know, they had a, this relationship. But what was... So crazy for me growing up is I never met my father, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, when I was about five years old, I used to pass him on my way to the local primary school. But prior to that, he would um, visit my mother once a week. And um, at the time, because she was trying to raise children without any um, father involved or money for her children, she turned our little Welsh cottage into a home for mentally handicapped people. So the, the government would give her money to take care of these people, but that meant they had to live in a real house and we had to live in trailers in the backyard. So she had her own trailer. So that's why when my father would visit late at night, we never saw him. It's not like he came into a house where we could see him or anything. So for many, I remember when I was really little, I kept thinking, saying to her, you know, because she would sort of the next day, she'd be telling us all about how wonderful he was. And I'd be sitting there thinking, well, how come you get him and we don't get him? <laughs> so I would, I would say, well, you know, why can't he come a bit earlier? Why can't he, you know, be with, see, come and see us? And she kept saying, well, he can't. And if he would, if he could, but he really loves you, but you know, he can't. And, and, you know, and I knew about that he had a wife. And, um, but I just didn't realize how strange our upbringing was until I went to the local primary school and realized that everybody knew about the situation. And we were the sort of scarlet children of the scarlet woman. And there was a lot of judgment and it was very painful. There was a lot of shame. And, um, and I'd also met my father's wife. She came to visit us one day when I was about four years old. And I, I could see then how unbelievably distressed and, and upset she was. And I remember feeling very, um, very guilty. I felt that we, I had caused this, my mother and I had caused this upset that I was witnessing. And so I remember in that moment, I remember thinking, oh my God. I mean, I could hear the words she was saying and using, and clearly I was not a nice child. And I remember thinking at that time, 
oh my God, I should never have been born. I've hurt this woman or whatever my mum and I have done by being here, we've hurt her and her family. And that, that was just compounded when I went to school as well. So I definitely felt that, you know, being illegitimate, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's something about not being legal or not being, and, and I just felt the difference. It was such a stigma back then of, of not being um, equal to other people. And for some reason, I just took that so literal. I'm very literal anyway, but I was very <laughs> literal as a child too. And I just took it literally that I am worth less than other people. I should never have been here. I somehow snuck in, um, you know, unwelcome. And I just carried that through life with me. And also the fact that, you know, my father never acknowledged us or, or not, never spoke to us. He, we would literally see him when we were going to school and he would just look the other way and just never saw us. And I had this crazy thinking because my mother said he loved us, but he never spoke to us or acknowledged him. So I kept thinking, well, there's something wrong with me because he's this loving man, apparently. Mm-hmm. And it's got to be there's something wrong with me. I'm not pretty enough skinny enough, clever enough, sweet enough, whatever the enoughs were, I, was always, I had a list of them. And I think innocently as a young child, sometimes we blame ourselves because we think, well, if we blame ourselves and there's something wrong with us, if we fix it, we can fix the situation mm-hmm. as opposed to that person's just incapable of loving us for whatever reason. That's a little yeah. bit too final. And I think that's what I felt in my world anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I just grew up feeling that I was, like I said, less than, not good enough, and, um, and, and afraid, to be really honest. I mean, having mentally ill people living with you at such a young age was quite terrifying. They were mentally handicapped and mentally ill. They'd come from the local mental institution that had closed down. And my mother then rented this great big rambling mansion when I was about nine years old. So we actually got to live in a room in a house, which was great. But at that point, she had about 55 mentally ill people living with us. And there was no family unit. There was no separate dwelling for us. We just were scattered over this giant great big mansion. And no locks on our doors and just craziness. I mean, literally craziness. And my mum was oblivious. I mean, she was in survival mode. She was doing the best she could. And she did an amazing job in so many ways. I mean, she was able to, you know, provide for us and send us all to private schools and and accomplish so much for a woman back then on her own. Um, And by then she'd had another child. So she had seven children in total. But it definitely, um, definitely impacted uh, how, I, how I developed. Um, I became, you know, as I said, I was in therapy for many, many years and diagnosed with codependency and um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I just went through life constantly um, feeling abandoned by my father, so therefore needy of male attention, which unfortunately brought with it unwanted male attention at a very young young age. And then I felt guilty for that. I felt I'd asked for it. And, you know, so there was just a lot going on. By the time I was 19, I just felt like, you know, I don't fit into the world. I shouldn't be here. I can't cope. <laughs> so everybody yeah. else is, everybody else can cope, but not me. Um, and then I sort of found myself coming to America at 21, just on holiday. And there was this whole world here of like spirituality and, and people, there was the Bodhi tree bookstore and there was, there was all these things to sort of discover. And I thought, God, I I just need to make sense of all of this. It's been crazy. And there's got to be a reason behind all of this. So I just started on that path and I think the very first workshop I did was Healing the Shame that Binds with um, John Bradshaw and started to feel a bit more like, okay, apparently there's enough other people to fill these great big... You weren't big alone rooms. in that workshop. <laughs> exactly. I wasn't alone. And, um, and so that was, that was just the whole thing. But, you know, the way I showed up in life, I was still very codependent. I was always sort of out of referencing hypervigilant. I was taking the temperature of other people. Like, um, you know, are you dangerous? Uh, do you like me? Don't you like me? Let me become needless and wantless. That was the other thing. My mother was so busy that she just 
she couldn't take it if we had any needs and wants. She was already basically raising seven children and 55 mentally ill people who, or, and handicapped people who were like children themselves. So can you imagine raising 60 plus children? And in her mind, it was like, well, you're okay, they're not. They, their needs come first. And so you really learn to just keep shoving down, shoving down and, and denying your own, um, your own inner wisdom and your own voice. Yeah. And um, it took me years to realize that what I thought was love was actually longing. Unless I was like longing for the love of an unobtainable man, I didn't think I was in love. All these wonderful men would come my way and I was like, no, get out of the way. I want that one over there, the really unavailable yeah. one. <laughs> so I was always like, you know, recreating my childhood and, and getting myself in these situations that were, you know, sort of definitely not conducive to having happy, healthy relationships. I love, um, there's so much in that. Um, but, it, you know, the thing about just how that happens when you're, you were four-ish and this woman mm-hmm. comes to the house and it, just how smart our minds are and how much, even then, now what you came up with wasn't helpful. <laughs> like yeah. I, I created this for her, me and my mom made her feel this way. Therefore, mm-hmm. there's something wrong with me, all of that. It wasn't helpful, but it was kind of smart for a four-year-old. And that's what our minds do. They're just trying to figure things out. And I love how you said, if you could blame yourself, it feels like it gives us something to fix. It's, it's so preferable to, I don't know why this happened. Life is unpredictable. You know, like we will make up a horrible story just to have something and then we get to kind of work on it. Yeah, yeah. And, and to follow on on that, the fact that we keep also recreating that situation from childhood with with this belief that we can get it right this time. I can win over an unavailable man and then I've proved myself. Yes. So it's just that that trick that that we do, that we find ourselves in. And so, um, yeah, it was, like I said, the therapy took me from (sighs) really not functioning very well at all to functioning pretty well. I mean, I had um, two amazing therapists during that time um, who one was a, 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 an older man who became like a father figure to me, which I, I really needed and wanted and loved and enjoyed. And unfortunately he passed away. And then I had another one who was like a brother to me. He was a, a like an older brother that had two sons as well. And so he, I think he really helped me with, with how to raise my children in a healthy way. Because, you know, the model of parenting I'd had from, from my mother was as, as much as it was the best she could do, it was that sort of type of parenting that was, um, well, let's go back for a second. She was, she was an atheist. So we used to call her mother, father, God, because it was like she was everything <laughs> rolled into one. And she was all we ever had. I mean, literally all we ever had. And if you pissed her off or upset her, she would just re- withdraw her affection. And you were just frozen out until you towed the line and you know got back in line. Yeah. And and I think that um, you know that type of parenting it it seems effective because your children like like I said get back in line, but I think it's damaging. I think that the subtle message is it's like I'll abandon you if you don't become who I want you to be. Yeah. And because she was everything to us, and there was nothing else, nobody else. We didn't have extended family. We didn't even in the community, because we lived in a big old mansion full of mentally ill people, but people didn't come over to play. So we sort of had each other and that was it. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, so he helped me a lot. So I saw so much good in what I gained through therapy, but I could not stop the codependent behavior. I mean, it was just running my life. I was a people pleaser, I was needless and wantless. I kept finding myself, not always, I had some wonderful relationships too, but those are the ones I always left. And then I had <laughs> relationships with narcissistic partners that were, you know, very, very painful. And, um, you know, it's so interesting. That's, that's why I, my, most of my practice is with dealing with people or helping people rather, dealing with issues around codependency and narcissism because even though it's not, physical abuse I I felt like I wish I had a bruise I wish I had a cut to show on the outside what I'm feeling on the inside and I think it's often 
misunderstood how when you've constantly been sort of almost brainwashed as to how, you know, sort of, um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, but, but it's so subtle. You, you completely lose a sense of yourself. You lose any sort of sense or trust in hearing your own wisdom because you've been told you're crazy so many times that you don't even, you know, so, so anyway, so it was, um, it was when I came across the principles that I saw something so differently. I, you know, on so many levels, I, um, you know, I saw that, you know, I wasn't my story. That was a massive one. <laughs> saw that I wasn't broken or defective and that we're all born equal. And I'd heard that for years. I did a master's in spiritual psychology at USM and I heard all that. It was just words in my head. And I kept thinking, you know, God, I wish I could believe that. And I never did for some reason. I'd heard it, like I said, for many, many years, different modalities, but it didn't, didn't resonate with me. Um, when I came across the principles, it was, I just saw it. I saw it and I didn't even see it. I felt it. That's really what happened. I just, I got it. I got it in my gut. And, um, and you actually helped me a, a wonderful one. When I had insecure thoughts, I didn't realize that that's just a habit. Those, those insecure thoughts are just a habit. I used to believe that they're, well, they're mine. They're telling me something about me because they're in my head. And they've lived there for years, so they've got to be talking about me, nobody else. Um, but just to see them as that was just a habit that I bought through time. I just kept, you know, believing that they were true. And it was amazing to just go, oh, that's just like, that's a habit like any other habit. And to just not buy into it. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that in the in a moment, it's not going to feel true or that you aren't still have some kind of pull toward the codependent behaviors and all of that mm-hmm. at time. But I, I can hear as you share this, just how, um, I don't know, like a little further removed you got, like a little bit more onto it you've become. Yeah, yeah time. absolutely. Yeah. And it really is. And it, for me, it, was, it wasn't the, I've got to change these thoughts. These thoughts have to not come in anymore and then I'll be better. It was like, no, I have to, it's my relationship with my thoughts that I'm changing. The fact that I am not taking them so seriously or that I don't fight them or resist them or try and control them. It's just like, oh, you've shown up again. You yeah. know, like that yeah. sort of lightness with it. Like, oh, well, you're here again. And before you know it, they just don't show up as often. It has to be that way because these thoughts have been around, like they were totally protective in a sense to you. They were, they were there to protect you. They were the best your little kid mind could see to do and to hold on to, to make it through. And they were helpful in some way to become, to be able to be needless and wantless. Like that's not a good strategy long-term, but that (laughs) you needed that, you know? No, exactly. And, and, your point is, and it's brilliant, and I actually came to that because at one point I thought, why would these voices in my head say such terrible things to me? Why would, why would they want to keep me so down, yeah. you know? And then I thought, oh, my God, it was trying to protect me. Yeah. It's because if I was, I literally saw this, like, solid black figure, like stone, pinning me down on, like, a wrestling mat with my hands over my head, spitting these words at me. And then I thought, oh, it's keeping me down so that I don't get any hurt anymore. Mm. Like if I, if I sort of like raised up and started showing myself, then I could be rejected and hurt again. So it's keeping me down, telling yeah. me all these other things before other people tell me those other things. That's, that was the irrational reasoning, this, I call it the ego, whatever you want to call it. But this thing that was keeping me down thought it was helping me. It genuinely was a protective, you know, a coping mechanism and a protective, um, you know, if you hear it from me first, it won't hurt so much when you hear it from others. Right. <laughs> Crazy as that oh, is. But that's so big. I mean, yeah. so big to see, um, yes, that it was always, it was misguided. It was unnecessary in the big picture, but in your life, it was, it was trying to help you. I just think that it's been so huge for so many people because all of a sudden, yeah, it's not 
you're not defective. You're perfectly working where you're working perfectly well. Everything's working the way it should be. There's just a little misunderstanding. You're just taking it a little too seriously or a little misunderstanding around it to, to wake up and see. So yeah. it's not evil, you know, it's helpful, yeah. but misguided. And, and you know, and it was so interesting because I had this sort of image of this solid black stone thing on top of me when I actually had the sort of a gentleness and that awareness of, oh, oh, you've been trying to help me. That's it was like a, there was a sweetness to that almost. And this thing just started like sort of crumbling, like shattering and crumbling. And wow. it sort of became ash and it just sort of landed all around me. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> nothing to fight here. That's amazing. <laughs> lit, yeah, it was so visual for me. I thought I can just sit up, get up. And start taking steps forward. <laughs> wow. um, yeah, it was really, it was an amazing, it, it was, yeah, I don't even know, it sort of came to me in a dream, but then it kept coming during the day. I couldn't sort of shake it until it finally sort of morphed into what it was, which was just nothing. Yeah. Just nothing. So how has it gone with um, your attraction to certain people and that type of thing? Like, like you, were you... Um, attracted to people who are unavailable and narcissistic do you think because you were trying to write that because that's how your parents both felt to you yeah absolutely I think it was like I said I think it was like um I can control this I can have a different outcome and then yeah. I can let it go and um and also oh very much so I I felt so like the second class citizen and so worthless that you know that that love bombing as they call it that sort of you know you're the perfect one you you you've been who yeah, I've been yeah. looking for all my life and they put you on a pedestal I was so vulnerable to that you know now if anybody was to say that to me I would just be like you know you're crazy <laughs> number one you don't even know me and number two you're exhibiting behaviors that that right, I right. you know I know the warning signs of now but back then I was just I was the I was the beacon for it I was like a moth to the flame of of what? You adore me? You love me? Okay, I'm yours. And then that sort of, you know, the boiling of the frog, it's like, you know, that sort of slowly the criticism starts. And, and I say, you know, I was classic codependent, you know, the codependent as in the giving too much. So my perfect fit was somebody that liked to receive a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> putting it politely. So, but then as soon as you want to say, well, what about me? It's like you're trying to change the rules of the game. And they're like, no, this is not about you. This is about you giving to me. And I just, and that's where the struggle would be. But I think of my sort of, you know, fears of abandonment and also that first flush of incredible, oh, whatever that feeling of being adored is, it's like you want that back. And that is intermittently given to you over time and pulled away and, you, I mean, it is, it's Stockholm Syndrome. You're completely sort of, you're on the pedestal, you're off the pedestal, you're rescued, you're put back on, and it's, it spins your head around. You don't even, you just lose sight of it. And, and for me, I definitely know that um, um, I was looking for something I didn't have as a child. There was still that child part of me that wanted the, the sort of picture of the, of the, um, you know, the perfect couple and, and, um, you know, I, I never talk about specific relationships. So I, gotta be, I want to make sure I'm not talking about specific relationships, but I could see that there was a need and a want in me that had not been fulfilled as a child. And I was trying to fulfill it in my adult life for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that was, that was it. But, but, um, yeah, I've been in a wonderful relationship for the last, um, few years now. And, um, Initially, it was, you know, unless I was in the midst of drama and turmoil and everything, I didn't feel in love, I didn't feel alive. So with my, my, my partner that I'm with now, initially it was like, gosh, um, hmm, this feels a little boring. <laughs> He's a nice <laughs> guy. but And I, thank God, I had that little thing inside me saying, don't walk away this time, you know? Just stay, just see. You don't have to make any commitments, but you can just see. And it really is amazing how that sort of became real love, deep, deep love based on respect and and shared values and and not that sort of um, 
thrill that I think a lot, and I think society too, and I think fairy tales we grow up with. I mean, my God, it's like Beauty and the Beast is the classic, you know, <laughs> <You've> got, <laughs> or even like sort of Charlotte Bronte novels. And, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I think we're, I know I certainly um, was attracted to sort of winning somebody over that was misunderstood and hurting as I saw it. Yeah. And I do, you know, I, I feel that people that do exhibit narcissistic behavior are hurting. But I also trust that they have within them what it takes to, to um, well, I think they have their own innate well-being and in what is what I'm trying to say. I don't think that they need to be rescued by other women, I mean, other people that have their, their um, equally sort of faulty thinking maybe that's that's having them be attracted to that type of relationship where they think, well, if I'm needed, I won't be abandoned. So this is safe for me. I'll pick somebody that's as broken as me. You know, that was, I think, my thinking. It was like, right. I, I didn't want somebody that was, you know, had had a happy childhood and everything was fine because it was like, well, how can I relate to you? Um, whereas now, I wouldn't. it wouldn't even occur to me to think that way. It's like... You know, but I was matching pain for pain. It's like you have to come in with, with a lot of stuff before before yeah, I want yeah. to be with you. It's so it just sounds like such a huge um such a huge uh ground that you've traveled. <laughs> like from being really in enmeshed in all that and that's what yeah. you were attracted to and that's just what felt safe to not, you know. So yeah. how does it feel like um like that was very gradual. Does it feel like, like it was kind of obviously starting to crumble and look different over time, but then, but then it kind of fell away more toward the end recently or how has that gone? I, I, I really do think that that, you know, as I say, I came across the principles in 2009 originally, it was just through a book that it wasn't called the principle. So I couldn't deepen my understanding back then. It was very, very helpful. And I remember thinking, wow, this is different. This is helping me. Um, Because it was right around my divorce and my mind was going crazy (laughs) is the only thing I can say. And um, I saw a book in 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 an airport bookshop and it said, stop thinking, start living. And I was like, stop thinking, please. Yes, please. (laughs) (laughs) And I sort of took this book and I read it cover to cover from London to LA. And I was like, boy, there's something here. Um, but then I read some of his other books. It was Richard Carson, and it just didn't quite have that same impact that first book had. Then I came across The Principles again in 2015. Still didn't know it was The Principles. It was through Steve Chandler. And then in two th- end of 2016, I came across it again, and I realized there's all of these teachers, all of these books, and I just dove in head first, and just every living, breathing moment, I was absorbing it. And that's really where I felt the freedom come completely because until that point I was still taking things personally. I still was trying to wrap my head around irrational behavior. Um, how, why, how could they, what, you know, what's wrong with me? Why are they being this way to me? And boy, when I came across that understanding of separate realities and that we're all living in our thought created <laughs> in a little bubble, yeah. I was able to go, oh, there's no real reality out there that I'm seeing and that you can't see because there's something wrong with you. We're all living in our own little, you know, thought bubble of, of what we're thinking and feeling. And so it just I, it, it freed me. I was just like, I don't have to try and get inside your head and understand why you're behaving in a certain way. It just is. Yeah. Oh, it, it is. It's just, it's, I mean, I know we say this all the time, but it's just seeing how it works. It's yeah. like, oh, this is how it works. Then it didn't have to be about you thinking differently, feeling differently, them thinking differently. Like, you know, you're just, you're jumping a level above that in a sense saying, yeah. here's how I think, here's how they think. And that's just us thinking. Yeah, exactly. It's just the way it is. And, and why torture myself over it? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in their head. I can't begin to imagine what they're thinking and feeling. So there's like a respect. It's a respect for the other person too. You don't have to make somebody bad or wrong. It's just like, that's just the way they are. Yeah. And I'm going to get on with my life and do it, you know, what, what I feel good about. 
that was that was a massive one for me. There's you know there's two things in your story that are like just so just in in all of this that are jumping out at me. One is just how how much this is. I'd say proof, but if we want to give it the weak word, we can say evidence. This mm-hmm. is such evidence that no matter what happens, no matter how long we've lived in any kind of trauma, any kind of whatever, it's possible to see, it's always possible to see that differently and be freed from it. It doesn't mean everyone will, but I mean, it is such a, do you know, like, yeah, it hasn't been easy. It wasn't overnight, like, but it's, I don't know, the story is just so obviously like, wow. So no matter what you grow up in, like it is possible to be free of that. Yeah, absolutely. And even with, you know, the sexual abuse, I, I, I used to think, I can't, I don't, I, well, I remember, you know, in my teens, but, but when I was very young, I remember saying in therapy, I don't want to remember, I don't want to remember, but, but I knew stuff happened. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember thinking I can't ever, I don't ever, I, I, I couldn't survive if I felt it or saw it again in a vision or something like that. Anyway, it happened, um, probably when I was around 2015, actually, I was in the the university of Santa Monica again and doing a program, um, consciousness, health and healing. And, and it did come up. But I had such a beautiful vision of, I was looking in one direction, seeing what I was seeing, but I I, I remember looking away and I saw myself as a young child and I was completely enveloped in love. I can't call it God, love, whatever it was, just enveloped in this beautiful feeling. I remember at that moment thinking, that's who I really am. That is untouched absolutely nothing happened to that. Nothing happened to that. And I could either choose to look back over here and get distressed, or I could choose to keep looking in this direction and seeing this image of being me being held in this beautiful, loving light. And I just thought, wow, that's it. And it was, it just, it took out any of that feeling of, of um, being broken or, or anything. Cause I just saw so clearly who I really was at my essence which was untouched, unharmed, pure love, whatever you want to call it. Wow. And yeah, it's just, it's, you know, and I feel really blessed that I saw that because I have nothing to be afraid of anymore. Okay, it came back, but I didn't have to, I didn't have to put my hand on that stove and keep looking in that direction and still feeling that. I didn't have to. And I saw very clearly there there was another way of looking at it. It's amazing. It's just so hopeful for people who understandably have gone through a lot of trauma mm-hmm. and say, there's no way I'm coming mm-hmm. through that. Who are just thinking the best they can do is cope or get through the day. You know, I mean, just to, to show that that essence is untouched and it's always available and we're all just trying to see it and feel it in our own way. But, you know, it's beautiful to know that it's there. Yeah. I'm so grateful for that experience. It was definitely life-changing for me as well. Yeah. The other thing, um, just kind of more on the psychology piece is so fascinating to me how, um, how predictable it is in a way. And I don't mean, and maybe that's not the best way of saying it, but like, like you started off saying, you know, we all think we're alone and certainly no one but you and your siblings had your exact childhood, but, but how the threads people do in their own way, right? And in their own degree, but they do. And the way that our, our psychology kind of tries to deal with things like that is, is so kind of easy to understand in a way. And it's sort of, it just makes me excited because it's like, oh, that was just Dell's mind thinking, oh, we can, we can make sure you're lovable. Let's go find a person like mom and do this and do that. You know, like just how our mind comes up with these ideas to help us. Um, and, you know, and just, I don't know, just in even how you share that and, and the codependency pattern and all of that, that is a thing that people go through. It's not who anyone is and no one's ever stuck in it, but it, the fact that it's so consistent and predictable in a sense, and people have their own flavor of it, 
I kind of find that really hopeful too, because it's like, oh, you just have a brain and that's just your brain doing what it does when it goes through that kind of trauma. Exactly. And that, when I first, that was what I also wanted to mention, when I first came across the principles, I, again, being very literal as I am, you know, hearing Bill Pettit say, well, there are no diagnoses and I think, I thought, oh, I can't, I used to coach people because after my therapy, my therapist is like, oh my God, you're an expert, <laughs> even beyond all the other therapists I know in, you know, in codependency and narcissistic abuse. And I used to coach people with that before I came across the principles. And then, and then I stopped it because I thought, oh, well, there's no diagnosis. I, I can't go there. And then it slowly started to come back to me in the last, you know, six months now, and, you know, people are like, I heard you used to do this. And I'm like, shh, we're in the 3P world. We're not supposed to talk about this. <laughs> it was just a misunderstanding. I, I sort of, you know, it's a shorthand. It's describing a set of behaviors. It's not the diagnosis that stays with you for life. And, and I can look at it and I can help people come from, you know, find the freedom that I found. And that's, and through the principles, which is what is so exciting. Because the other thing is, you learn that there's nothing to forgive. I know that sounds a massive one, but I really get that there's nothing to forgive. Again, my parents were just living in their own little thought bubble. My mum innocently thought she was doing the best she could, which I genuinely think she, she was. I mean, it might not be the sort of parenting I might do with my children, but, you know, and again with my father, I haven't a clue what was going on in his head. I don't know I, I can make stories up that it was after World War II and people were sort of living in the moment and t- grabbing what they could, any happiness they could. Yeah. Um, there was stuff like that. But the fact that I can have zero sort of judgment or um, residual pain from that is a freedom that is incredible to have that. The fact that, again, any of my sort of, you know, I don't even want to use the word abusers, but whoever they were that did things that might not have been appropriate. um, It's like, again, I don't know what was going through their head and I'm not going to waste one second of what I have trying to figure that out. It happened, didn't define me. It's not something I'm going to carry through my life. And there was another point I was going to make about the principles and the freedom it gave me, which is gone right now, but I know never to chase it and it'll come back if it's meant to. So, um, but yeah, the psychology is, it, it fascinates me. Oh, that's what I was going to say is even though I was one of seven children growing up in that environment, we all experienced it differently. Yeah. And even when my mum passed away a couple of years ago, um, my sister, one of my sisters had already passed away at the time. So there were six of us and we all, you know, you could say, well, I feel this way because my mum died and she was the only one I ever had. But then I looked at my siblings and we all felt differently. We all had a totally different experience of her, of her death. I mean, I felt this incredible amount of love and respect for her and I felt she hadn't gone anywhere. I felt she was just gone through that veil from the, you know, 4% world into the 96% world. Um, felt like I could just sort of chat with her whenever and save airline fares, not having to go <laughs> back and forth and visit her. But it was a very gentle, very, you know, peaceful passing. Her passing was to me. It wasn't um, painful. And there were many years where I hit points when I was in my therapy where I felt like, how could you? How could you have made some of the choices? And but, you know, towards the end, it was just like all I just saw was the beauty in who she was and the best she could do. And she was innocent in all of it. Oh. So. It is. Yes. It, I was wondering about your siblings and it is mm-hmm. amazing how you all had different experiences, probably some things in common, but yes, yeah. just different experiences. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, and it's amazing that you do see it that way and that it's not that... um it's not that you did a bunch of, I mean, maybe you did over the years, but it's not, it's not like you are where you are with it because, because you did all this work to forgive her or because of anything like that. It sounds like just the way you describe it is like, it just, that's just how it looks. It's just yeah. how it looks. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, like I said, when I came across the principles, cause though Jimmy, the therapy, there was, there was a lot of, you know, sort of, I'd feel better and then I'd go back into it and then I'd feel better. And then I'd sort of hit 
sort of pockets of, of residual anger or whatever. And boy, that sort of the freedom of just like, like I said, that separate realities was, was huge for me. It was a really, really life changing understanding. Yeah. And it's so much deeper than just different perspectives. I'd always known yeah. different perspectives, but there was still, there was, it was just a different, a much, much deeper understanding of, of you know, how I'm. Different perspectives like assumes there's one reality and we just see it with our own flavor. Yes, but separate exactly. realities. It's such a good term because it's like, yeah. no, your whole reality is different than mine. Exactly. That's it. I was trying to put yeah. words, but that's exactly what it is. That is the subtle difference. And it fit because when sometimes I'll share what separate realities and people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, different perspectives. And it's like, right. well, <laughs> a lot deeper than that. Like that's a start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you still have times now, um, like in your current relationship with anyone in your life, um, where you feel some of that old familiar stuff come up? You know, it's interesting um, because I think it's so funny. You can have sort of your adult relationships or intimate relationships that might have reflected that pattern. But it shows up everywhere. It shows up with your boss. It shows up with your children. It can show up with your friends. And um, yeah, so I'm, 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 I see it and I, and I know that it's just, I, I know that it's not good for me and it's not good for the relationship and it's not good for the other person. Um, so I catch myself a lot more and it's sometimes, you know, I'm, I've still got that sort of people pleaser flavor to me, <laughs> you yeah. know, I want to keep people happy, but, um, and I don't like confrontation. You know, those are things that, um, that I would avoid at all costs before. Um, but now I've learned to sort of really speak my truth. And if somebody doesn't like it and, you know, say my children, if I have to say to them, you know, they're adults, adults now, they're 23 and 27. But if I do say something and they don't particularly like, you know, what I've shared before I used, would dive in and try and fix it and excuse it and try and, you know, pacify and make them feel better. But now it's just like, okay, well, they're just having their experience and they're entitled to that. And I don't have to do anything. I was respectful in how I held my boundary and, Mm -hmm. and they'll, you know, trusting that they have that innate well being inside them and they're going to come back to settling themselves. I don't have to do go in there and do anything and change me to make that happen it's again, it's like, so I'm getting more comfortable with um, tolerating some of these sort of, you know, feelings with me if they, they don't like that I've held that boundary. Um, so that's, that's a big thing I've noticed. Um, yeah, boundary. I mean, even as a coach, it's hysterical. because I still catch myself sometimes thinking, oh, I could be codependent in my coaching. You know, yeah. it's like, so it's, it's in, but I find it funny. I love it. Yeah. I love spotting the areas, you know, the little blind spots that you have and just sort of, and laughing about it. Like I said, just, just, it's like, oh, there it is again, you know, yeah, yeah. but not like, oh God, there it is again. Something's wrong with me. It's just like, oh gosh, this is sneaky. It's just popped in again. I can tell that you feel it that way. And I love that. I've seen that in so many people that have changed in different ways. Like, uh, you know, the old stuff comes back, but the more yeah. it does look funny or cute or even leads to gratitude. Like, wow, yeah. I'm so glad I don't believe you anymore. <laughs> you know, like to the voices in your head. And yeah. it's just like how our experience of that can change so much of the same thought same feeling yeah. it's amazing yeah it's really cool to see because I can I can feel that in you it's like the machinery <laughs> might still go there but you're like a, no not by yeah it. <laughs> no exactly exactly I love that it's like I've got that Britney Spears song in my head like whoops here I whoops, some, yeah. some, <laughs> whoops I, I did, did it again <laughs> <laughs> exactly but it, it's as light and fluffy and silly as that you know yeah. it's not it's not heavy it's nothing to sort of pick up something and beat myself up about for sure yeah that's awesome. Oh my gosh. I love this conversation so much. I'm so, so glad we did this. And I'm so grateful that you are working with people on this. You have been for a while, but from this understanding and just what you've seen, I mean, oh my gosh, you have so much, so much to offer people who are going through this and just the hope alone, let alone anything you might share, just, just your story and just helping them truly see what's possible. Um, 
and I'm really excited that you're that you're looking toward writing about this because man, yeah. it's going to be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm excited too. Just got to get, just just got to get it on paper. It's, yeah. well, it's actually it's on paper. It's just all in different places. I've just got to sort of put it in the right order. But um, but yeah, excited to get the book out too. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Love awesome. Thanks so much, Del. It was great to talk with you. And you too. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Changeable. If you enjoy this podcast, please let me know by subscribing or maybe even considering leaving a review. iTunes reviews are so valuable in helping other people who need change to find their way here. I'll talk to you next week.